a reflection by Bertrand Russell, Nobel Prize winner in literature. Before considering how to educate, it is well to be clear as to the sort of result which we wish to achieve. Dr. Arnold wanted humbleness of mind, a quality not possessed by Aristotle's magnanimous man. Nietzsche's ideal is not that of Christianity, no more is Kant's. For while Christ enjoins love, Kant teaches that no action of which love is the motive can be truly virtuous, and even people who agree as to the ingredients of a good character may differ as to their relative importance. One man will emphasize courage, another learning, another kindliness, and another rectitude. One man, like the elder Brutus, will put duty to the state above family affection. Another, like Confucius, will put family affection first. All these divergences will produce differences as to education. We must have some conception of the kind of person we wish to produce before we can have any definite opinion as to the education which we consider best. Of course, an educator may be foolish, in the sense that he produces results other than those at which he was aiming. Uriah Heep was the outcome of lessons in humility at a charity school, which had had an effect quite different from what was intended. But in the main, the ablest educators have been fairly successful. Take as examples the Chinese literati, the modern Japanese, the Jesuits, Dr. Arnold, and the men who direct the policy of the American public schools. All these, in their various ways, have been highly successful. The results aimed at in the different cases were utterly different, but in the main the results were achieved. It may be worthwhile to spend a few moments on these different systems before attempting to decide what we should ourselves regard as the aims which education should have in view. Traditional Chinese education was, in some respects, very similar to that of Athens in its best days. Athenian boys were made to learn Homer by heart from beginning to end. Chinese boys were made to learn the Confucian classics with similar thoroughness. Athenians were taught a kind of reverence for the gods which consisted in outward observances and placed no barrier in the way of free intellectual speculation. Similarly, the Chinese were taught certain rites connected with ancestor worship but were by no means obliged to have the beliefs which the rites would seem to imply. An easy and elegant scepticism was the attitude expected of an educated adult. Anything might be discussed, but it was a trifle vulgar to reach very positive conclusions. Opinions should be such as could be discussed pleasantly at dinner, not such as men would fight for. Carlyle calls Plato a lordly Athenian gentleman, very much at his ease in Zion. This characteristic of being at his ease in Zion is also found in Chinese sages and is, as a rule, absent from the sages produced by Christian civilizations, except when, like Goethe, they have deeply imbibed the spirit of Hellenism. The Athenians and the Chinese alike wished to enjoy life and had a conception of enjoyment which was refined by an exquisite sense of beauty. There were, however, great differences between the two civilizations, owing to the fact that, broadly speaking, the Greeks were energetic and the Chinese were lazy. The Greeks devoted their energies to art and science and mutual extermination, in all of which they achieved unprecedented success. Politics and patriotism afforded practical outlets for Greek energy. When a politician was ousted, he led a band of exiles to attack his native city. When a Chinese official was disgraced, he retired to the hills and wrote poems on the pleasures of country life. Accordingly, the Greek civilization destroyed itself, but the Chinese civilization could only be destroyed from without. These differences, however, seem not wholly attributable to education, since Confucianism in Japan never produced the indolent cultured scepticism which characterized the Chinese literati, except in the Kyoto nobility, who formed a kind of Faubourg Saint Germain. Chinese education produced stability and art. It failed to produce progress or science. Perhaps this may be taken as what is to be expected of scepticism, 
passionate beliefs produce either progress or disaster, not stability. Science, even when it attacks traditional beliefs, has beliefs of its own and can scarcely flourish in an atmosphere of literary scepticism. In a pugnacious world which has been unified by modern inventions, energy is needed for national self-preservation. And without science, democracy is impossible. The Chinese civilization was confined to the small percentage of educated men, and the Greek civilization was based on slavery. For these reasons, the traditional education of China is not suited to the modern world and has been abandoned by the Chinese themselves. Cultivated 18th century gentlemen, who in some respects resemble Chinese literati, have become impossible for the same reasons. Modern Japan affords the clearest illustration of a tendency which is prominent among all the great powers, the tendency to make national greatness the supreme purpose of education. The aim of Japanese education is to produce citizens who shall be devoted to the state through the training of their passions and useful to it through the knowledge they have acquired. I cannot sufficiently praise the skill with which this double purpose has been pursued. Ever since the advent of Commodore Perry's squadron, the Japanese have been in a situation in which self-preservation was very difficult. Their success affords a justification of their methods, unless we are to hold that self-preservation itself may be culpable. But only a desperate situation could have justified their educational methods, which would have been culpable in any nation not in imminent peril. The Shinto religion which must not be called in question even by university professors, involves history which is just as dubious as Genesis. The Dayton trial pales into insignificance beside the theological tyranny in Japan. There is an equal ethical tyranny. Nationalism, filial piety, Mikado worship, etc. must not be called in question, and therefore many kinds of progress are scarcely possible. The great danger of a cast-iron system of this sort is that it may provoke revolution as the sole method of progress. This danger is real, though not immediate, and is largely caused by the educational system. We have thus in modern Japan a defect opposite to that of ancient China. Whereas the Chinese literati were too sceptical and lazy, the products of Japanese education are likely to be too dogmatic and energetic. Neither acquiescence in scepticism nor acquiescence in dogma is what education should produce. What it should produce is a belief that knowledge is attainable in a measure, though with difficulty, that much of what passes for knowledge at any given time is likely to be more or less mistaken, but that the mistakes can be rectified by care and industry. In acting upon our beliefs, we should be very cautious where a small error would mean disaster. Nevertheless, it is upon our beliefs that we must act. This state of mind is rather difficult. It requires a high degree of intellectual culture without emotional atrophy. But though difficult, it is not impossible. It is, in fact, the scientific temper. Knowledge, like other good things, is difficult, but not impossible. The dogmatist forgets the difficulty. The sceptic denies the possibility. Both are mistaken, and their errors, when widespread, produce social disaster. The Jesuits, like the modern Japanese, made the mistake of subordinating education to the welfare of an institution, in their case, the Catholic Church. They were not concerned primarily with the good of the particular pupil, but with making him a means to the good of the Church. If we accept their theology, we cannot blame them. To save souls from hell is more important than any merely terrestrial concern and is only to be achieved by the Catholic Church. But those who do not accept this dogma will judge Jesuit education by its results. These results, it is true, were sometimes quite as undesired as Uriah Heep. Voltaire was a product of Jesuit methods. But on the whole, and for a long time, the intended results were achieved. The Counter-Reformation and the collapse of Protestantism in France must be largely attributed to Jesuit efforts. To achieve these ends, they made art sentimental, thought superficial, and morals loose. In the end, 
the French Revolution was needed to sweep away the harm that they had done. In education, their crime was that they were not actuated by love of their pupils, but by ulterior ends. Dr. Arnold's system, which has remained in force in English public schools to the present day, had another defect, namely, that it was aristocratic. The aim was to train men for positions of authority and power, whether at home or in distant parts of the empire. An aristocracy, if it is to survive, needs certain virtues. These were to be imparted at school. The product was to be energetic, stoical, physically fit, possessed of certain unalterable beliefs, with high standards of rectitude, and convinced that it had an important mission in the world. To a surprising extent, these results were achieved. Intellect was sacrificed to them, because intellect might produce doubt. Sympathy was sacrificed, because it might interfere with governing inferior races or classes. Kindliness was sacrificed for the sake of toughness, imagination for the sake of firmness. In an unchanging world, the result might have been a permanent aristocracy, possessing the merits and defects of the Spartans. But aristocracy is out of date, and subject populations will no longer obey even the most wise and virtuous rulers. The rulers are driven into brutality, and brutality further encourages revolt. The complexity of the modern world increasingly requires intelligence, and Dr. Arnold sacrificed intelligence to virtue. The Battle of Waterloo may have been won on the playing fields of Eton, but the British Empire is being lost there. The modern world needs a different type, with more imaginative sympathy, more intellectual suppleness less belief in bulldog courage and more belief in technical knowledge. The administrator of the future must be the servant of free citizens, not the benevolent ruler of admiring subjects. The aristocratic tradition embedded in British higher education is its bane. Perhaps this tradition can be eliminated gradually. Perhaps the older educational institutions will be found incapable of adapting themselves. As to that, I do not venture an opinion. The American public schools achieve successfully a task never before attempted on a large scale, the task of transforming a heterogeneous selection of mankind into a homogeneous nation. This is done so ably, and is on the whole such a beneficent work, that on the balance great praise is due to those who accomplish it. But America, like Japan, is placed in a peculiar situation and what the special circumstances justify is not necessarily an ideal to be followed everywhere and always. America has had certain advantages and certain difficulties. Among the advantages were a higher standard of wealth, freedom from the danger of defeat in war, comparative absence of cramping traditions inherited from the Middle Ages. Immigrants found in America a generally diffused sentiment of democracy and an advanced stage of industrial technique. They see, I think, are the two chief reasons why almost all of them came to admire America more than their native countries. But actual immigrants, as a rule, retain a dual patriotism. In European struggles, they continue to take passionately the side of the nation to which they originally belonged. Their children, on the contrary, lose all loyalty to the country from which their parents have come and become merely and simply Americans. The attitude of the parents is attributable to the general merits of America. That of the children is very largely determined by their school education. It is only the contribution of the school that concerns us. In so far as the school can rely upon the genuine merits of America, there is no need to associate the teaching of American patriotism with the inculcation of false standards. But where the old world is superior to the new, it becomes necessary to instill a contempt for genuine excellences. The intellectual level in Western Europe and the artistic level in Eastern Europe are, on the whole, higher than in America. Throughout Western Europe, except in Spain and Portugal, there is less theological superstition than in America. In almost all European countries, the individual is less subject to her domination than in America. His inner freedom is greater even where his political freedom is less. In these respects, 
the American public schools do harm. The harm is essential to the teaching of an exclusive American patriotism. The harm, as with the Japanese and the Jesuits, comes from regarding the pupils as means to an end, not as ends in themselves. The teacher should love his children better than his state or his church. Otherwise, he is not an ideal teacher. When I say that pupils should be regarded as ends, not as means, I may be met by the retort that, after all, everybody is more important as a means than as an end. What a man is as an end perishes when he dies. What he produces as a means continues to the end of time. We cannot deny this, but we can deny the consequences deduced from it. A man's importance as a means may be for good or for evil. The remote effects of human actions are so uncertain that a wise man will tend to dismiss them from his calculations. Broadly speaking, good men have good effects and bad men bad effects. This, of course, is not an invariable law of nature. A bad man may murder a tyrant because he has committed crimes which the tyrant intends to punish. The effects of his act may be good, though he and his act are bad. Nevertheless, as a broad general rule, a community of men and women who are intrinsically excellent will have better effects than one composed of people who are ignorant and malevolent. Apart from such considerations, children and young people feel instinctively the difference between those who genuinely wish them well and those who regard them merely as raw material for some scheme. Neither character nor intelligence will develop as well or as freely where the teacher is deficient in love. And love of this kind consists essentially in feeling the child as an end. We all have this feeling about ourselves. We desire good things for ourselves without first demanding a proof that some great purpose will be furthered by our obtaining them. Every ordinarily affectionate parent feels the same sort of thing about his or her children. Parents want their children to grow, to be strong and healthy, to do well at school and so on, in just the same way in which they want things for themselves. No effort of self-denial and no abstract principle of justice is involved in taking trouble about such matters. This parental instinct is not always strictly confined to one's own children. In its diffused form, it must exist in anyone who is to be a good teacher of little boys and girls. As the pupils grow older, it grows less important. But only those who possess it can be trusted to draw up schemes of education. Those who regard it as one of the purposes of male education to produce men willing to kill and be killed. For frivolous reasons are clearly deficient in diffused parental feeling. Yet they control education in all civilised countries except Denmark and China. But it is not enough that the educator should love the young. It is necessary also that he should have a right conception of human excellence. Cats teach their kittens to catch mice and play with them. Militarists do likewise with the human young. The cat loves the kitten, but not the mouse. The militarist may love his own son, but not the sons of his country's enemies. Even those who love all mankind may err through a wrong conception of the good life. I shall try, therefore, before going any further, to give an idea of what I consider excellent in men and women quite without regard to practicality or to the educational methods by which it might be brought into being. Such a picture will help us afterwards when we come to consider the details of education. We shall know the direction in which we wish to move. We must first make a distinction. Some qualities are desirable in a certain proportion of mankind, others are desirable universally. We want artists, but we also want men of science. We want great administrators, but we also want ploughmen and millers and bakers. The qualities which produce a man of great eminence in some one direction are often such as might be undesirable if they were universal. Shelley describes the day's work of a poet as follows. He will watch from dawn to gloom. The lake reflected sun illume. The honeybees in the ivy bloom. Nor heed nor see what things they be. 
These habits are praiseworthy in a poet, but not, shall we say, in a postman. We cannot therefore frame our education with a view to giving everyone the temperament of a poet, but some characteristics are universally desirable, and it is these alone that I shall consider at this stage. I make no distinction whatever between male and female excellence. A certain amount of occupational training is desirable for a woman who is to have the care of babies, but that only involves the same sort of difference as there is between a farmer and a miller. It is in no degree fundamental and does not demand consideration at our present level. I will take four characteristics which seem to me jointly to form the basis of an ideal character. Vitality, courage, sensitiveness and intelligence. I do not suggest that this list is complete, but I think it carries us a good way. Moreover, I firmly believe that by proper physical, emotional and intellectual care of the young, these qualities could all be made very common. I shall consider each in turn. Vitality is rather a physiological than a mental characteristic. It is presumably always present where there is perfect health, but it tends to ebb with advancing years and gradually dwindles to nothing in old age. In vigorous children it quickly rises to a maximum before they reach school age, and then tends to be diminished by education. Where it exists, there is pleasure in feeling alive, quite apart from any specific pleasant circumstance. It heightens pleasures and diminishes pains. It makes it easy to take an interest in whatever occurs, and thus promotes objectivity, which is an essential of sanity. Human beings are prone to become absorbed in themselves, unable to be interested in what they see and hear, or in anything outside their own skins. This is a great misfortune to themselves, since it entails at best boredom and at worst melancholia. It is also a fatal barrier to usefulness, except in very exceptional cases. Vitality promotes interest in the outside world. It also promotes the power of hard work. Moreover, it is a safeguard against envy, because it makes one's own existence pleasant. As envy is one of the great sources of human misery, this is a very important merit in vitality. Many bad qualities are of course compatible with vitality, for example, those of a healthy tiger. And many of the best qualities are compatible with its absence. Newton and Locke, for example, had very little. Both these men, however, had irritabilities and envies from which better health would have set them free. Probably the whole of Newton's controversy with Leibniz, which ruined English mathematics for over a hundred years, would have been avoided if Newton had been robust and able to enjoy ordinary pleasures. In spite of its limitations, therefore, I reckon vitality among the qualities, which it is important that all men should possess. Courage, the second quality on our list, has several forms, and all of them are complex. Absence of fear is one thing, and the power of controlling fear is another. And absence of fear in turn is one thing when the fear is rational, another when it is irrational. Absence of irrational fear is clearly good, so is the power of controlling fear. But absence of rational fear is a matter as to which debate is possible. However, I shall postpone this question until I have said something about the other forms of courage. Irrational fear plays an extraordinarily large part in the instinctive, emotional life of most people. In its pathological forms, as persecution mania, anxiety complex or what not, it is treated by alienists. But in milder forms, it is common among those who are considered sane. It may be a general feeling that there are dangers about, more correctly termed anxiety or a specific dread of things that are not dangerous, such as mice or spiders. It used to be supposed that many fears were instinctive, but this is now questioned by most investigators. There are apparently a few instinctive fears, for instance, of loud noises, but the great majority arise either from experience or from suggestion. Fear of the dark, for example, seems to be entirely due to suggestion. 
most vertebrates, there is reason to think, do not feel instinctive fear of their natural enemies, but catch this emotion from their elders. When human beings bring them up by hand, the fears usual among the species are found to be absent. But fear is exceedingly infectious. Children catch it from their elders even when their elders are not aware of having shown it. Timidity in mothers or nurses is very quickly imitated by children through suggestion. Hitherto, men have thought it attractive in women to be full of irrational terrors, because it gave men a chance to seem protective without incurring any real danger. But the sons of these men have acquired the terrors from their mothers and have had to be afterwards trained to regain a courage, which they need never have lost if their fathers had not desired to despise their mothers. The harm that has been done by the subjection of women is incalculable. This matter of fear affords only one incidental illustration. I am not at the moment discussing the methods by which fear and anxiety may be minimised. That is a matter which I shall consider later. There is, however, one question which arises at this stage, namely, can we be content to deal with fear by means of repression, or must we find some more radical cure? Traditionally, aristocracies have been trained not to show fear, while subject nations, classes and sexes have been encouraged to remain cowardly. The test of courage has been crudely behavioristic. A man must not run away in battle. He must be proficient in manly sports. He must retain self-command in fires, shipwrecks, earthquakes, etc. He must not merely do the right thing, but he must avoid turning pale, or trembling, or gasping for breath, or giving any other easily observed sign of fear. All this I regard as of great importance. I should wish to see courage cultivated in all nations, in all classes, and in both sexes. But when the method adopted is repressive, it entails the evils always associated with that practice. Shame and disgrace have always been potent weapons in producing the appearance of courage, but in fact they merely cause a conflict of terrors, in which it is hoped that the dread of public condemnation will be the stronger. Always speak the truth except when something frightens you, was a maxim taught to me in childhood. I cannot admit the exception. Fear should be overcome not only in action, but in feeling, and not only in conscious feeling, but in the unconscious as well. The purely external victory over fear, which satisfies the aristocratic code, leaves the impulse operative underground and produces evil twisted reactions which are not recognised as the offspring of terror. I am not thinking of shell shock, in which the connection with fear is obvious, I am thinking rather of the whole system of oppression and cruelty by which dominant castes seek to retain their ascendancy. When recently in Shanghai, a British officer ordered a number of unarmed Chinese students to be shot in the back without warning, he was obviously actuated by terror just as much as a soldier who runs away in battle. But military aristocracies are not sufficiently intelligent to trace such actions to their psychological source. They regard them rather as showing firmness and a proper spirit. From the point of view of psychology and physiology, fear and rage are closely analogous emotions. The man who feels rage is not possessed of the highest kind of courage. The cruelty invariably displayed in suppressing Negro insurrections, communist rebellions and other threats to aristocracy is an offshoot of cowardice and deserves the same contempt as is bestowed upon the more obvious forms of that vice. I believe that it is possible so to educate ordinary men and women that they shall be able to live without fear. Hitherto, only a few heroes and saints have achieved such a life, but what they have done, others could do if they were shown the way. For the kind of courage which does not consist in repression, a number of factors must be combined. To begin with the humblest, health and vitality are very helpful, though not indispensable. Practice and skill in dangerous situations are very desirable. But when we come to consider, not courage in this and that respect, but universal courage, 
something more fundamental is wanted. What is wanted is a combination of self-respect with an impersonal outlook on life. To begin with, self-respect. Some men live from within, while others are mere mirrors of what is felt and said by their neighbours. The latter can never have true courage. They must have admiration and are haunted by the fear of losing it. The teaching of humility, which used to be thought desirable, was the means of producing a perverted form of this same vice. Humility suppressed self-respect, but not the desire for the respect of others. It merely made nominal self-abasement the means of acquiring credit. Thus, it produced hypocrisy and falsification of instinct. Children were taught unreasoning submission and proceeded to exact it when they grew up. It was said that only those who have learned to obey know how to command. What I suggest is that no one should learn how to obey and no one should attempt to command. I do not mean, of course, that there should not be leaders in cooperative enterprises, but their authority should be like that of a captain of a football team, which is suffered voluntarily in order to achieve a common purpose. Our purposes should be our own, not the result of external authority, and our purposes should never be forcibly imposed upon others. This is what I mean when I say no one should command and no one should obey. There is one thing more required for the highest courage, and that is what I called just now an impersonal outlook on life. The man whose hopes and fears are all centred upon himself can hardly view death with equanimity, since it extinguishes his whole emotional universe. Here, again, we are met by a tradition urging the cheap and easy way of repression. The saint must learn to renounce self, must mortify the flesh and forgo instinctive joys. This can be done, but its consequences are bad. Having renounced pleasure for himself, the ascetic saint renounces it for others also, which is easier. Envy persists underground and leads him to the view that suffering is ennobling and may therefore be legitimately inflicted. Hence arises a complete inversion of values. What is good is thought bad, and what is bad is thought good. The source of all the harm is that the good life has been sought in obedience to a negative imperative, not in broadening and developing natural desires and instincts. There are certain things in human nature which take us beyond self without effort. The commonest of these is love, more particularly parental love, which in some is so generalised as to embrace the whole human race. Another is knowledge. There is no reason to suppose that Galileo was particularly benevolent, yet he lived for an end which was not defeated by his death. Another is art. But in fact, every interest in something outside a man's own body makes his life to that degree impersonal. For this reason, paradoxical as it may seem, a man of wide and vivid interests finds less difficulty in leaving life than is experienced by some miserable hypochondriac whose interests are bounded by his own ailments. Thus, the perfection of courage is found in the man of many interests, who feels his ego to be but a small part of the world, not through despising himself, but through valuing much that is not himself. This can hardly happen except where instinct is free and intelligence is active. From the union of the two grows a comprehensiveness of outlook unknown both to the voluptuary and to the ascetic, and to such an outlook personal death appears a trivial matter. Such courage is positive and instinctive, not negative and repressive. It is courage in this positive sense that I regard as one of the major ingredients in a perfect character. Sensitiveness, the third quality in our list, is in a sense a corrective of mere courage. Courageous behaviour is easier for a man who fails to apprehend dangers, but such courage may often be foolish. We cannot regard as satisfactory any way of acting which is dependent upon ignorance or forgetfulness. The fullest possible knowledge and realisation are an essential part of what is desirable. The cognitive aspect, however, comes under the heed of intelligence. Sensitiveness, in the sensi, in which I am using the term, belongs to the emotions. 
A purely theoretical definition would be that a person is emotionally sensitive when many stimuli produce emotions in him. But taken thus broadly, the quality is not necessarily a good one. If sensitiveness is to be good, the emotional reaction must be in some sense appropriate. Mere intensity is not what is needed. The quality I have in mind is that of being affected pleasurably or the reverse by many things and by the right things. What are the right things, I shall try to explain. The first step, which most children take at the age of about five months, is to pass beyond mere pleasures of sensation, such as food and warmth, to the pleasure of social approbation. This pleasure, as soon as it has arisen, develops very rapidly. Every child loves praise and hates blame. Usually the wish to be thought well of remains one of the dominant motives throughout life. It is certainly very valuable as a stimulus to pleasant behaviour and as a restraint upon impulses of greed. If we were wiser in our admirations, it might be much more valuable. But so long as the most admired heroes are those who have killed the greatest number of people, love of admiration cannot alone be adequate to the good life. The next stage in the development of a desirable form of sensitiveness is sympathy. There is a purely physical sympathy. A very young child will cry because a brother or sister is crying. This, I suppose, affords the basis for the further developments. The two enlargements that are needed are, first, to feel sympathy even when the sufferer is not an object of special affection. Secondly, to feel it when the suffering is merely known to be occurring, not sensibly present. The second of these enlargements depends mainly upon intelligence. It may only go so far as sympathy with suffering, which is portrayed vividly and touchingly, as in a good novel. It may, on the other hand, go so far as to enable a man to be moved emotionally by statistics. This capacity for abstract sympathy is as rare as it is important. Almost everybody is deeply affected when someone he loves suffers from cancer. Most people are moved when they see the sufferings of unknown patients in hospitals. Yet when they read that the death rate from cancer is such and such, they are as a rule only moved to momentary personal fear, lest they or Someone dear to them should acquire the disease. The same is true of war. People think it dreadful when their son or brother is mutilated, but they do not think it a million times as dreadful that a million people should be mutilated. A man who is full of kindliness in all personal dealings may derive his income from incitement to war or from the torture of children in backward countries. All these familiar phenomena are due to the fact that sympathy is not stirred, in most people, by a merely abstract stimulus. A large proportion of the evils in the modern world would cease if this could be remedied. Science has greatly increased our power of affecting the lives of distant people without increasing our sympathy for them. Suppose you are a shareholder in a company which manufactures cotton in Shanghai. You may be a busy man who has merely followed financial advice in making the investment. Neither Shanghai nor cotton interests you, but only your dividends. Yet you become part of the force leading to massacres of innocent people. And your dividends would disappear if little children were not forced into unnatural and dangerous toil. You do not mind, because you have never seen the children, and an abstract stimulus cannot move you. That is the fundamental reason why large-scale industrialism is so cruel, and why oppression of subject races is tolerated. An education producing sensitiveness to abstract stimuli would make such things impossible. Cognitive sensitiveness, which should also be included, is practically the same thing as a habit of observation, and this is more naturally considered in connection with intelligence. Aesthetic sensitiveness raises a number of problems which I do not wish to discuss at this stage. I will therefore pass on to the last of the four qualities we enumerated, namely, intelligence. One of the great defects of traditional morality has been the low estimate it placed upon intelligence. The Greeks did not err in this respect, but the church led men to think that nothing matters except virtue, 
and virtue consists in abstinence from a certain list of actions arbitrarily labelled sin. So long as this attitude persists, it is impossible to make men realise that intelligence does more good than an artificial conventional virtue. When I speak of intelligence, I include both actual knowledge and receptivity to knowledge. The two are, in fact, closely connected. Ignorant adults are unteachable. On such matters as hygiene or diet, for example, they are totally incapable of believing what science has to say. The more a man has learnt, the easier it is for him to learn still more, always assuming that he has not been taught in a spirit of dogmatism. Ignorant people have never been compelled to change their mental habits and have stiffened into an unchangeable attitude. It is not only that they are credulous where they should be sceptical, it is just as much that they are incredulous where they should be receptive. No doubt the word intelligence properly signifies rather an aptitude for acquiring knowledge than knowledge already acquired. But I do not think this aptitude is acquired except by exercise, any more than the aptitude of a pianist or an acrobat. It is, of course, possible to impart information in ways that do not train intelligence. It is not only possible, but easy and frequently done. But I do not believe that it is possible to train intelligence without imparting information, or at any rate, causing knowledge to be acquired. And without intelligence, our complex modern world cannot subsist. Still less can it make progress. I regard the cultivation of intelligence, therefore, as one of the major purposes of education. This might seem a commonplace, but in fact it is not. The desire to instill what are regarded as correct beliefs has made educationists too often indifferent to the training of intelligence. To make this clear, it is necessary to define intelligence a little more closely so as to discover the mental habits which it requires. For this purpose, I shall consider only the aptitude for acquiring knowledge, not the store of actual knowledge which might legitimately be included in the definition of intelligence. The instinctive foundation of the intellectual life is curiosity, which is found among animals in its elementary forms. Intelligence demands an alert curiosity, but it must be of a certain kind. The sort that leads village neighbours to try to peer through curtains after dark has no very high value. The widespread interest in gossip is inspired not by a love of knowledge, but by malice. No one gossips about other people's secret virtues, but only about their secret vices. Accordingly, most gossip is untrue, but care is taken not to verify it. Our neighbours' sins, like the consolations of religion, are so agreeable that we do not stop to scrutinise the evidence closely. Curiosity properly so called, on the other hand, is inspired by a genuine love of knowledge. You may see this impulse, in a moderately pure form, at work in a cat which has been brought to a strange room and proceeds to smell every corner and every piece of furniture. You will see it also in children, who are passionately interested when a drawer or cupboard, usually closed, is open for their inspection. Animals, machines, thunderstorms, and all forms of manual work arouse the curiosity of children whose thirst for knowledge puts the most intelligent adult to shame. This impulse grows weaker with advancing years, until at last, what is unfamiliar inspires only disgust, with no desire for a closer acquaintance. This is the stage at which people announce that the country is going to the dogs and that things are not what they were in my young days. The thing which is not the same as it was in that far-off time is the speaker's curiosity. And with the death of curiosity, we may reckon that active intelligence also has died. But although curiosity lessens in intensity and in extent after childhood, it may for a long time improve in quality. Curiosity about general propositions shows a higher level of intelligence than curiosity about particular facts. Broadly speaking, the higher the order of generality, the greater is the intelligence involved. This rule, however, must not be taken too strictly. Curiosity dissociated from personal advantage 
shows a higher development than curiosity connected, say, with a chance of food. The cat that sniffs in a new room is not a wholly disinterested scientific inquirer, but probably also wants to find out whether there are mice about. Perhaps it is not quite correct to say that curiosity is best when it is disinterested, but rather that it is best when the connection with other interests is not direct and obvious, but discoverable only by means of a certain degree of intelligence. This point, however, it is not necessary for us to decide. If curiosity is to be fruitful, it must be associated with a certain technique for the acquisition of knowledge. There must be habits of observation, belief in the possibility of knowledge, patience and industry. These things will develop of themselves given the original fund of curiosity and the proper intellectual education. But since our intellectual life is only a part of our activity, and since curiosity is perpetually coming into conflict with other passions, there is need of certain intellectual virtues, such as open-mindedness. We become impervious to new truth, both from habit and from desire. We find it hard to disbelieve what we have emphatically believed for a number of years, and also what ministers to self-esteem or any other fundamental passion. Open-mindedness should therefore be one of the qualities that education aims at producing. At present, this is only done to a very limited extent, as is illustrated by the following paragraph from the Daily Herald, July 31, 1925. A special committee, appointed to inquire into the allegations of the subversion of children's minds in Bootle schools by their school teachers, has placed its findings before the Bootle Borough Council. The committee was of opinion that the allegations were substantiated, but the council deleted the word substantiated and stated that the allegations gave cause for reasonable inquiry. A recommendation made by the committee and adopted by the council was that in future appointments of teachers, they shall undertake to train the scholars in habits of reverence towards God and religion and of respect for the civil and religious institutions of the country. Thus, whatever may happen elsewhere, there is to be no open-mindedness in Bootle. It is hoped that the Borough Council will shortly send a deputation to Dayton, Tennessee, to obtain further light upon the best methods of carrying out their programme. But perhaps that is unnecessary. From the wording of the resolution, it would seem as if Bootle needed no instruction in obscurantism. Courage is essential to intellectual probity, as well as to physical heroism. The real world is more unknown than we like to think. From the first day of life, we practice precarious inductions and confound our mental habits with laws of external nature. All sorts of intellectual systems, Christianity, socialism, patriotism, etc., are ready, like orphan asylums, to give safety in return for servitude. A free mental life cannot be as warm and comfortable and sociable as a life enveloped in a creed. Only a creed can give the feeling of a cosy fireside while the winter storms are raging without. This brings us to a somewhat difficult question. To what extent should the good life be emancipated from the herd? I hesitate to use the phrase herd instinct because there are controversies as to its correctness. But, however interpreted, the phenomena which it describes are familiar. We like to stand well with those whom we feel to be the group with which we wish to cooperate. Our family, our neighbours, our colleagues, our political party, or our nation. This is natural, because we cannot obtain any of the pleasures of life without cooperation. Moreover, emotions are infectious, especially when they are felt by many people at once. Very few people can be present at an excited meeting without getting excited. If they are opponents, their opposition becomes excited. And to most people, such opposition is only possible if they can derive support from the thought of a different crowd in which they will win a probation. That is why the communion of saints has afforded such comfort to the persecuted. Are we to acquiesce in this desire for cooperation with a crowd or shall our education try to weaken it? There are arguments on both sides, 
and the right answer must consist in finding a just proportion, not in a wholehearted decision for either party. I think myself that the desire to please and to cooperate should be strong and normal, but should be capable of being overcome by other desires on certain important occasions. The desirability of a wish to please has already been considered in connection with sensitiveness. Without it, we should all be Boers and all social groups, from the family upwards, would be impossible. Education of young children would be very difficult if they did not desire the good opinion of their parents. The contagious character of emotions also has its uses, when the contagion is from a wiser person to a more foolish one. But in the case of panic fear and panic rage, it is of course the very reverse of useful. Thus, the question of emotional receptivity is by no means simple. Even in purely intellectual matters, the issue is not clear. The great discoverers have had to withstand the herd and incur hostility by their independence. But the average man's opinions are much less foolish than they would be if he thought for himself. In science, at least, his respect for authority is on the whole beneficial. I think that in the life of a man whose circumstances and talents are not very exceptional, there should be a large sphere where what is vaguely termed herd instinct dominates, and a small sphere into which it does not penetrate. The small sphere should contain the region of his special competence. We think ill of a man who cannot admire a woman unless everybody else also admires her. We think that, in the choice of a wife, a man should be guided by his own independent feelings, not by a reflection of the feelings of his society. It is no matter if his judgments of people in general agree with those of his neighbours, but when he falls in love, he ought to be guided by his own independent feelings. Much the same thing applies in other directions. A farmer should follow his own judgment as to the capacities of the fields which he cultivates himself, though his judgment should be formed after acquiring a knowledge of scientific agriculture. An economist should form an independent judgment on currency questions, but an ordinary mortal had better follow authority. Wherever there is special competence, there should be independence. But a man should not make himself into a kind of hedgehog, all bristles to keep the world at a distance. The bulk of our ordinary activities must be cooperative, and cooperation must have an instinctive basis. Nevertheless, we should all learn to be able to think for ourselves about matters that are particularly well known to us, and we ought all to have acquired the courage to proclaim unpopular opinions when we believe them to be important. The application of these broad principles in special cases may, of course, be difficult. But it will be less difficult than it is at present in a world where men commonly have the virtues we have been considering in this chapter. The persecuted saint, for instance, would not exist in such a world. The good man would have no occasion to bristle and become self-conscious. His goodness would result from following his impulses and would be combined with instinctive happiness. His neighbours would not hate him, because they would not fear him. The hatred of pioneers is due to the terror they inspire, and this terror would not exist among men who had acquired courage. Only a man dominated by fear would join the Ku Klux Klan or the Fascisti. In a world of brave men, such persecuting organisations could not exist, and the good life would involve far less resistance to instinct than it does at present. The good world can only be created and sustained by fearless men. But the more they succeed in their task, the fewer occasions there will be for the exercise of their courage. A community of men and women possessing vitality, courage, sensitiveness and intelligence in the highest degree that education can produce would be very different from anything that has hitherto existed. Very few people would be unhappy. The main causes of unhappiness at present are ill health, poverty and an unsatisfactory sex life. All of these would become very rare. Good health could be almost universal and even old age could be postponed. Poverty 
since the Industrial Revolution is only due to collective stupidity. Sensitiveness would make people wish to abolish it, intelligence would show them the way, and courage would lead them to adopt it. A timid person would rather remain miserable than do anything unusual. Most people's sex life, at present, is more or less unsatisfactory. This is partly due to bad education, partly to persecution by the authorities and Mrs. Grundy. A generation of women brought up without irrational sex fears would soon make an end of this. Fear has been thought the only way to make women virtuous, and they have been deliberately taught to be cowards, both physically and mentally. Women in whom love is cramped encourage brutality and hypocrisy in their husbands and distort the instincts of their children. One generation of fearless women could transform the world by bringing into it a generation of fearless children, not contorted into unnatural shapes, but straight and candid, generous, affectionate and free. Their ardour would sweep away the cruelty and pain which we endure because we are lazy, cowardly, hard-hearted and stupid. It is education that gives us these bad qualities and education that must give us the opposite virtues. Education is the key to the new world, but it is time to have done with generalities and come to the concrete detail in which our ideals are to be embodied.